Coming up in this episode. So in 1999, I was really just kind of coming back, but I was, fuck, I was, I was hungry like I hadn't eaten in five years. And everything was clicking, man. I was fit. I was light. I was strong. And so before the tour, I went out, and I'm talking, you know, probably three weeks before the tour, went out and broke the record, broke Rominger's record on the Madone, just to get into the specifics. So that was just call it 30 minutes. I don't remember. It might have been just under 30 minutes. I averaged 495 watts for 30 minutes. That's freaking crazy, right? right? Like, I mean, I think just for like normal people, just like looking around the, the spin studio, like I, you can't even hold that for like, you know, it's a sprint. Yeah, it is. And, <laughs> and I and I chuckle too, because if I had to go, I mean, I could, you know, it's, again, I'm, I'm currently at 8,000 feet, so you have to factor that in as well. But if I was at sea level, I don't, I mean, if somebody said, okay, go ride 495 watts for as long as you can, and knowing that I'd been able to do it for 30 or 40 minutes at some point in my life, I mean, that day that I broke that record, I could have kept going. Hey, everyone. Before we continue my conversation with Lance, I want to share a Memorial Day special from HVMN, the mothership to our lovely podcast. First and foremost, let's remember that this holiday is in memory of service members who've lost their lives. We pay our respects to those who've sacrificed everything for our country and mourn their loss. For this Memorial Day weekend, we're mixing it up, literally. Our team has developed a handy electric frother that makes mixing powders, such as our MCT oil powder, into your coffee or smoothie a complete breeze. I used to be a caveman and used to be mixing all these powders with a fork, but I finally joined the modern era with our high performance frother. And we're offering as a free bonus with any purchase of either our Keto Collagen Plus or our MCT oil powder. Simply visit the link go.hvmn.com slash mix dash it dash up and enter the promo code mix it up one word m-i-x-i-t-u-p at checkout. This sale ends on May 25th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. PST, so act fast. More details are included in the show notes. For listeners who might have missed this special bonus offer period, the frother goes for $14.95. Like all of the products that we put under our HVMN umbrella, the frother is super high performance, so I'm confident it'll blow any other frother on the market out of the water. Now, back to my conversation with Lance Armstrong. Hey everyone, this is your host, Jeffrey Wu, and I'm really excited to bring on my podcast conversational partner today. He really needs no introduction, Lance Armstrong. Great to have you on the program. Thank you, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Doing okay. Still coming through the other side of the COVID-19 epidemic. How are you holding up one, friends, family, safe, and then any adjustments as you've been uh, getting to this new norm, new reality? So the first part, we've all been, I guess, pretty lucky. I split my time between Aspen and Austin, Texas. And ironically, Aspen had one of the first kind of hotbeds or, or breakouts for COVID-19. It's probably been probably six weeks. And then, you know, the town, it's a very small town. It's a little box canyon. You either drive up Valley or you go over the pass. The pass this time of year is closed. So, you know, they just did a, a really good job of completely shutting down town. Also has its side effects of shutting down the local economy, probably putting half the restaurants out of business long term. So, you know, it's it's not without its negative stuff. And then Austin's been spared by and large thus far. Although I think, you know, as these states choose to reopen, I think it's anybody's guess. You know, we've just kind of holed up on our own and, and managed to stay fit and healthy and, and huddle up as a family. And so, you know, that part of it, I actually think has been really healthy uh, for us as a family, but also for, for many other families, just this opportunity to hit reset. 100%. Just practically speaking, this really pushes the limits of what people have studied in terms of both epidemiology, virology, and as well as the economic side. I think it's just a, a multifactorial problem. And we're all in a giant experiment here. They're all kind of go through together. But it sounds like, yeah, especially in the Bay Area where we're based, it seems relatively mellow compared to some of the East Coast. I mean, I, I think... And I don't want to be a proponent of fake news or anything relating to that, but but I do think that the media and I, and again I also don't want to minimize the loss of life, but but I think in the end of any time and it, it gosh it could be it could have been my life or it could be any process that I or we or you guys go through at the end of 
any process, you have to look back, whether you were really successful or whether you were just tremendously uh, unsuccessful, you have to look back and go, okay, what what happened, right? How were we successful? Was this uh, beneficial? Who was served, et cetera, et cetera. So when this is all said and done, and I do think, you know, we'll get there maybe sooner than later, you know, we'll have to look back and say, okay, in, in the grand totals, you know, loss of life, of jobs, loss of uh, uh, GDP. I mean, all of these things that we know are happening, we will be able to go back and, and understand whether or not, and again, not to minimize it, but whether or not we made too much out of it. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of the media, especially cable news, but uh, you know they love things like this. Let me just put it in perspective. If you turn on any of the cable news networks, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever, it's all you see. It's all you hear. It's all, it's all you're able to watch. But here's, so here's a question for you guys and for the audience. When's the last time you thought about you know, the millions of acres that are burning in Australia. You, you have it. You forgot. Yeah, forgot. It. There was talks about World War III with uh, us killing the Iranian general, right? Like that was right in January. That seems like a decade ago. Let me make it even more exaggerated. When is the last time you thought about Kobe Bryant? All that to say, the media, not that they love the loss of life. I'm not trying to pin that on them, but they love these stories that capture our attention and capture our, our, our time. And so uh, this is just yet another one of those stories uh, for them, again, not minimizing the total impact. Yeah. And I think especially on the cable news, because it's like a three minute, five minute segment, you hit your talking points and then they're essentially motivated or incentivized to just make it splashy. That's where I think podcast formats, I know you're involved in a number of podcasts and media, and I think that's where we see the success of this kind of format. You actually want to have a long form conversation to dive in the nuance here. I think that will be the future. I think media will be changing. You're exactly right. Like there's not to minimize the loss of life or the role of journalism. I think there's absolutely a role to be played there. But you've experienced some of that personally through your journey, just like how media comes and builds people up and then just tries to destroy them. It's You probably have one of the most <laughs> yeah. interesting vantage points of just seeing that and living through that. Yeah. And it it's definitely colored my view of that industry. So that's why I preface all of it with saying, you know, I am who I am. So I, I obviously have a, a shrewder view of that. And I also understand that they're just chasing those stories, whether it was my the meltdown of my story seven or eight years ago, you know, that was great for them. That old expression, you know, that if you had 10 houses on the street and nine of them are absolutely gorgeous and perfectly manicured lawns and one of them's on fire. I mean, they're covering the fire. Yep. It is what it is and, and we can't control it. And at the end of the day, it's really about competition, right? I mean, it, podcasting is just the next frontier when it comes to creating content and, you know, aka the media. And so if you think about how we got to this place, you have to go all the way back basically to transistor radios or just people talking on the street. Then you had the news broadcast via little radios and then you had, you know, somebody invented the television and then all of a sudden you had one channel and then three channels and then you had cable TV and then you had the internet and now you have, you know, it's just a chase. It's a chase for people's attention. And so in that regard, I can't, I can't blame them. I mean, you you guys are doing this and and creating content. I do the same thing, and so it's there's only seven billion people in the world, so you're we're all vying for their attention somehow, some way. Yeah, and hopefully through these longer form conversations, people actually learn something rather than hey, here's like the crazy headline that just grabs your. It's like this snack food of content. In in terms of going into shelter in place quarantine. Any adjustments in terms of nutrition, diet, exercise? Obviously, folks are perhaps a little bit more limited in terms of access to gyms, access mm-hmm. to food. I know you mentioned in terms of that family time. I think that's definitely been a silver lining for me in terms of it's kind of like a nice timing with spring cleaning, especially in the HVMN context. We talk a lot about human performance, biohacking fasting. It's kind of like an autophagy of your schedule, of your calendar. And I've definitely appreciated this time to really look at the calendar and say like, hey, these are things that I don't really need anymore. That They're like not really fun or not really productive for me. And it's a really easy excuse to kind of cut those out. Any yeah. low hanging fruit that you've been able to kind of turn those <laughs> lemons into lemonade at, at this point? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I'm i a big fan of alcohol. I love, I love having, you know, whether it's red wine or tequila or vodka, or, you know, that's just been a, a part of my day for really a long time. And so it's maybe the timing was completely accidental, maybe not, but it just felt like we were on the verge of completely going crazy. And when people go crazy, they don't necessarily make the best decisions. And I view myself as, you know, if there are 10 people in the room, I'm, I, I might be in the top half, but I'm barely in the top half. <laughs> and so if I need to be as sharp and as smart and as clear as I can possibly be. So I completely going on seven, seven and a half weeks now, 
just completely eliminated all alcohol from my life. And so it's been interesting and it's been fucking amazing. I have to tell you, because let me tell you, and not to be uh, sound like a college kid, but I love to get drunk more than maybe anybody. But the last seven and a half weeks, they, they might have been some of the best seven, best weeks I've had uh, in my life. So I've doubled down on that, doubled down on fitness. And I'm not trying to be a, trying to get up on my crown or my perch here or my throne, but just my level of engagement and patience, especially with my children uh, and my family has been something that frankly, I'm shocked at. And I just, uh, I'm so humbled and psyched that it's rolling out the way it is. Look, I look forward to the day when somebody has a great meal and opens up a, an old Bordeaux or an old Napa cab and have a glass or two. But for me, it's been a real game changer. And that coupled with deciding to get super fit again and get back on the bike and uh, back on the run. And even just strength stuff, you mentioned gyms being closed. And I read yesterday that Gold's Gym's filing for bankruptcy. I mean, you talk about yeah. An, an American fitness institution. I mean, we can talk about Peloton and SoulCycle and Equinox and and Orange Theory and and Barry's Bo- all these things right now. But we're talking about the people who who created that path. I mean, Gold's Gym is Gold's Gym. You know, that, that's like re- uh, opening the paper and reading that Chevrolet went out of business. And yeah. So you know, you have to adjust. And the one thing that'll never go out of business for me when it comes to fitness and and any kind of strength work is gravity. Nobody will put gravity out of business. So that means a push-up's a push-up, a squat, an air squat's an air squat, a burpee's a burpee, a pull-up's a pull-up. That's all gravity. You know, people can buy for 20 bucks, you can buy a band set up and do plenty of strength work. And so we've adjusted that way in and around our house. Cool. So a lot of calisthenics. Actually, that's essentially what I've been doing. I've been doing a workout called a Murph, which is a CrossFit workout. Mm-hmm. So it's sure. 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats, and, and a mile at the front end and the tail end. I've done 45 in a row. So it's been like a good study rhythm for me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, what does like a typical workout look like for you now? Especially talking to a lot of folks who have done and competed at the highest levels of their sport. Sometimes it's like weird to go back on the bike or like weird to go back in the rowing boat. But it sounds like you've been fairly active, you know, cycling for fun. What does a typical workout look like for you these days? Well, you know, workout is kind of a loose, (laughs) there's no structure to it. If I, if I ride and, and again, we're getting to this time of year into May and we're Aspen and you can't necessarily ride the trails right here in the city as of yet. There's still up high, there's still snow and the trails that are, that aren't covered in snow, there's still too uh, just too soggy. And so we, we've been driving down Valley, uh, closer to Basalt and Carbondale. And there the trails are just perfect. If I go out for a three hour ride with friends, there's no structure. You know, a lot of them are a bit slower. So I'll just hammer as hard as I can go on, on a climb and wait at the top and you know, <laughs> check my phone, do emails, just look at the beauty or whatever and wait for them and we'll we'll regroup and go again. And so that's totally informal. I probably have more structure in and around uh, the runs that I've been doing uh, the last few months. I've just, for no particular reason, not training for anything, just gotten back into my run game, probably more so because my time in Austin, is just a lot easier to run there. Our, our road infrastructure isn't certainly what it is, you know, places like Colorado, California, or Europe. Um, and so it's just easier and safer to run. So I'm, you know, run an hour a day, except on the weekends, I have a two hour run on, uh, on Sundays. And then one day during the week, one or two days during the week, it'll be a little more specific, uh, with some accelerations, AKA a fartlek. Although I hate the name, I hate that name. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. <clears throat> I have too many kids to say that name out loud. Yeah, you know, and feeling good and knock on wood, my body's held up. I haven't ridden for as long as I have and older cyclist hips, you know, they don't love two hour runs, but tried to spend a lot of time just on on the soft tissue and making sure that I can still hold up. And also just too for burning calories and getting as fit as possible. I think the run is the most efficient way to do it, especially as as the world reemerges and goes somewhat goes back to normal. We'll see what normal's like, but just a lot easier to travel with a pair of running shoes than it is a, a bike and all the gear. Yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty solid. I mean, that's a decent amount of training volume. Obviously, not necessarily like professional competition level amount of training, but very high volume for your everyday person. Yeah, the one the one thing I did leave out is my co-host and my partner in crime on a lot of my shows, George Hincapie, his Yep. They were we he and I did it before all this really started, probably the last actual trip I made, we were in Mexico with some guys and a bunch of Instagram photos and every single one of his fans uh, on Instagram were calling me fat and, and, <laughs> and um, they called me prosperous, which is, I think is kind of way the cool kids call, you know, people that got soft. And yeah. so I saw that and I was like, all right, fuck it. I want to be maybe prosperous, but not that kind of prosperous. So I'm trying to get it back. 
That's a good way to put it. I want to dive a little bit more into the human performance nerding out stuff. We have a lot of community members interested in some of the performance markers and, and measures. So through your career, you know, cycling is just a very quantitative sport. Mm-hmm. Was there a specific physiological metric that you were, you were most proud of? I remember Dr. Peter Tia was on Joe Rogan talking about you potentially having a very, very high lactate tolerance. And right. for folks who uh, don't know exactly what that is, when you're working out, you build up lactic acid, and that's kind of when your muscles fatigue and very sore. And it's not like you can kind of mentally power through, literally your muscles like don't respond anymore. Right. Is that true? Any other metrics? You know, it, did you have like a very high wattage to weight ratio? Yeah. What are your thoughts on, on, on that perspective? What drove some of the success in your career? All, all of that is, is true. And um, what I like to tell people about lactic acid is because a lot of people just don't understand it. or But most people can understand that if they were just standing still at the foot of a really steep hill and they could imagine, or if they had, just run up it as fast as they could, right? You, they would start to, they would be sprinting and then they would start to slow down and then they would really start to suffer and then eventually they would stop. And what stops them is lactic acid, right? The buildup of lactic acid in the muscle, That's that ultimately is what is going to stop you when you're just sprinting up that hill. The key in a lot of sports, but especially in endurance sports, but also especially in dynamic endurance sports, cycling is not a, it isn't a marathon. It's not like swimming the 1500 meters uh, in the Olympics where it's, where you get in and you really pace yourself. This is a game you got 200 guys on the road. So you might you might have an idea for how you want to pace yourself, but there's 199 other guys that may have their idea. And so you have to be able, you know, in that sense, it's a bit like NASCAR, right? So the race yep. is fluid, the race is dynamic, the race accelerates, the race slows down, uh, the race stops, and the race does a lot of things. But when the race is in the final hour of an uphill finish, it's still very dynamic and people are going to go very hard, but there's going to be attacks and accelerations and there's going to be regroupings. So as lactate builds, as, as, as the race accelerates, the race gets to the finish and people start attacking and, and trying to animate the race, everybody's lactate is high. But there's going to be this moment, there's going to be a lull in the action. And so let's just say your lactate shot up to seven millimoles. Most people consider somewhere around, let's just say four millimoles as the threshold. Whereas above four, you're really starting, the muscles are starting to, to slow down or stop. And so let's say it shoots up to seven. You know, most guys uh, in that lull, they might get it to six or five, whereas I was able to come down to two or three. And we tested this all the time. I mean, any indication we used for fitness or preparation was all based around lactate. Lactate and watts and body weight. And so it had nothing to do with speed, a little bit to do with heart rate, but heart rate's really an old metric. We measured wattage, which was really a game changer in cycling. We can get into that and we'll see if ultimately it becomes a game changer in running and and other action sports and and lactate, what we would ultimately call VAM, which is just a percentage of altitude climbed in a certain amount of time. And so, and then body weight. I mean, it had to be as close to weighing uh, as light as a jockey as you possibly could be and still stay healthy. Yep. It seemed like your cl- or lactate clearance was basically superior, essentially. So it's not necessarily the amount of lactate you could tolerate in terms of whether that's a pain, which is potentially more psychological. It was more of like a physiological clearance. You could just... Yeah, and the levels never got that high. I mean, I've, I've, you see guys with millimole, you know, lactate millimoles of, uh, in the teens. Yep. I don't think we ever saw more than seven. Interesting. And you're going max H, like heart rate, you were trying to sprint full out, you could just never elevate lactate that highly. When we would test, when we would try to test certain fitness levels, we would not, I mean, once you get to a certain point, you stop testing it. it I'm not a sprinter. So the, the, yeah. the, which the purpose is to try to figure out where your lactate threshold is. So we would figure that out. And then we might go and we always went in 25 watt increments. So you might do two more, two more tests after that. So you know, those were, uh, let's call it uncomfortable. Those were, you knew those were levels you couldn't sustain for, for very long, but no point in going out and doing a, you know, a, a, a max sprint test where you're trying to do a thousand Watts for 30 seconds. I mean, that's, that's just not anything that I ever would have done <laughs> with the training and, and, you know, he's a very controversial figure, but you know, everything is pretty much on the table now, but you know, Michele Ferrari's philosophy or his b- true belief about training was that it's, uh, we never trained ever, 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 ever trained above the threshold. We always trained 
either below or ju- just below what was the or the lactate threshold. And so that was, it actually made it a lot more pleasant. Um, yeah. It made the days longer and it made the efforts longer, but they were always just a notch below. You know, you get to that point where you're like, all right, I'm, I'm starting to feel that. And j- let me just sit here for, it could be 30 minutes. It could be 10 times, two minutes, whatever. But that was his belief. And the only time, and it's also his belief, and this is true, you would get efforts above lactate threshold in races. I mean, keep in mind, you know, the tour's 20 days, let's just call it. Going into the tour, you probably have anywhere from 35 to 55 race days. So again, those are those days where you're, you're no longer in charge. You have 200 guys there. They're going to let you know what they want to do for the day. And so, you know, those days would be obviously above lactate threshold. And so we use that time for that. And then the rest of the time we stayed below. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, I think, more and more you train towards the event, right? Really optimizing and peaking for the specific type of bout. And there's so many micro nuances that might not be obvious for the the lay watcher or the lay listener. I'm curious, especially with, you know, Peloton you mentioned, and I think people have a sense of their wattage potentially if they've been in quarantine and are just riding in their in, indoor gym or indoor living room. What were some of like the highlights on, on, on that side in terms of wattage per kilogram that might be somewhat of like a benchmark for folks who know a little bit about cycling what's peak performance what were you kind of hitting was there (laughs) was there like a highlight that stood out for you amongst all the other the competition i mean the numbers are big and and again i'm not trying to pull one over on anybody anymore we all know what what went down and and what didn't go down and whatever i say from now on uh with regards to this discussion you know just keep in mind i mean that's a high octane conversation you know this is not this is a high high octane time and it wouldn't have been possible on bread and water, but it was possible with, with with some rocket fuel, and so, uh, so to speak. But Ferrari always used this. He had a lot of athletes in the south of France, and if, either international guys that lived in Monaco or Nice, or just over the border in Italy. And so we always used a climb that was in. It started in a little village, seaside village in France called Menton. It was called the uh, Col de la Madone. Roughly a thirty-minute climb. He had his guys do it. Tony Romager was one of his riders, was a legend, legendary rider. He had the record. So in 1999, I was really just kind of coming back, but I was, fuck, I was, I was hungry like I hadn't eaten in five years. And everything was clicking, man. I was fit. I was light. I was strong. And so before the tour, I went out, and I'm talking, you know, probably three weeks before the tour, went out and broke the record, broke Romager's record on the Madone, just to get into the specifics. So that was just call it 30 minutes. I don't remember. It might've been just under 30 minutes. I averaged 495 watts for 30 minutes. That's freaking crazy, right? Uh, like, I mean, I think just for like normal people, just like looking around the, the spin studio, like I, you can't even hold that for like, you know, it's a sprint. Yeah, it is. And, <laughs> and I, and I chuckle too, because if I had to go, I mean, I could, you know, it's again, well, I'm, I'm currently at 8,000 feet. So you have to factor that in as well. But if I was at sea level, I don't, I mean, if somebody said, okay, go ride 495 watts for as long as you can. And knowing that I'd been able to do it for 30 or 40 minutes at some point in my life. I mean, that day that I broke that record, I could have kept going. I mean, the climb ended, so you're done and you break the record and, and you say, all right, I'm ready. But, and, and also keeping in mind, you know, the, it's one thing to crank 495 for half an hour, but if you weigh 200 pounds, it's not that impressive. So I was probably right around 72 kilos for, for us to go in pounds, you know, 75 kilos, is 165 so You're doing pounds. seven watts per ki- kilogram, which is Yeah, we all, I, I, I want every tour at close to seven watts per kilo. Any, anytime we were anywhere between six, five and seven per kilo, then again, this is a dynamic sport. So a lot of things can happen. Also a three week race, so you can get sick, any kind of sickness, a flu, a stomach bug. Then you get into the other issues, mechanical issues, flat tires, uh, derailers, crashes. I had one minor flat and one minor crash in seven years. That, that's unheard of. And I have not a lot to do with that. That really all goes to the strength of the team of keeping me out of trouble and keeping me at the front of the race. And yeah. Um, But yeah, cranking 500 watts for 30 minutes and just like licking your teeth, looking around going, bring it on. Like it was fun. It was, yeah. it was really fun. 
Yeah, and that's actually a good point, especially on the. Um, I, I don't want to say luck because obviously a lot of preparation and training went into it, but there's there's definitely like freak accidents that happen. You know, some bystander like jumps in front of you, or, or, or you know, like some freak accident. And over seven years, that kind of consistency is a lot of things worked and, and stacked together well. What was the difference? I mean, it sounds like you know anyone on that. I mean, the Tour de France is like probably arguably one of the most grueling events you could do, right? It's like 20, 30 days of maximal expenditure of muscle energy mm-hmm. it's like not super healthy right it's like right. you people probably lose yeah. a ton of weight yeah you took you took the words out of my mouth what would you say made you special mm-hmm. i mean it's on like this relatively even playing field everyone was trying to win everyone had preparation all of that good stuff would you say that there was a genetic component, like whether like you genetically were superior to hit kind of a seven k watts per kilogram, or was it a mental edge, some sort of psychological edge that you had built up over previous experiences? Yeah, there was a lot of that. I mean, a lot of everything you just mentioned. First and foremost, you know, my first tour victory was in '99. I had done the tour a few times before. I was, of course, diagnosed in '96 and set out '97 and came back to the sport in 98, to a largely uh, really chilly reception. I was basically homeless, <laughs> not literally homeless, but in terms of finding a team to base with and, and to uh, race for, there's no interest. So, you know, I, I came back with, um, I already was a kid with an attitude. I still am probably at this point, 48 years into my life, but I came back with a big chip on my shoulder and I just thought, I don't know how this is going to work out, but if I get the chance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuck some of these people over just straight up. That's just what I'm going to do. And I think in a lot of ways, that's, uh, I don't know if you guys are watching the Jordan documentary, but you know, that's the way the best think. It's like, get the fuck out of my way or I'm going to just run you over. And so it's great when you're training. It's great when you're competing. It's, it's not great when you, when your story becomes a cultural global phenomenon. And that's where I, I started to tread into some really dangerous water. And, and that's where, frankly, the story unraveled. But there was that, you know, you could break down just really simple physical characteristics, the length of your femur, right? The femur on a bike, a femur is a lever, right? So you have the, you have your ass is connected to the seat, your feet are connected to the pedals, everything else are levers, your femur, um, your shin, those are all levers. So I have, I guess in a weird way, I have relative to my height, I'm not very tall, I'm about 5'10", but but I have longer legs than I do have a torso. So you could get to that. You have the lactate factor. And then you start to get into the stuff that wasn't being done at the time. I mean, we, we put a ton of time into the technology, aerodynamics, weight of the bike, uh, structure of the team, the diet. I mean, that's probably the thing that upsets me the most about this fallout is, you know, it was just so convenient for folks to just say, oh, now we know. I mean, it was Ferrari. It was the doping. It was it really wasn't. I mean, and I'm at this point, I'm not here to fool or, or lie to anybody, but it wasn't. And that was all just sort of step 11 in a 10 step process. And so, boy, we put a lot of work into the team. Yeah. I mean, I think it's helpful to just understand the historical context of what the sport was like. And it just, it is what it is. Not necessarily anything anyone I would say is proud of, but it is what it is. And it's like still there was difference, right? Like everyone had access to all these types of things. And that was kind of the culture from what my understanding of, of the sport at the time. You know, it's not it, it was a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a, no, it was just a of course thing. Not. Well, it's not a it's not an ideal thing. Look, yeah. I wish it wouldn't have been that way. I'd have loved to have showed up to Europe in, in 1992 as a amateur, just turned pro after the Olympics, and gone to my first race, and everybody's sipping water and having a baguette. I'd have loved it, um, <laughs> but that wasn't the case, and I made the choice to stay and and fight the fight. But yeah, and it's not the and it's not. I want to say it's not ideal. I mean, as a as a father of five kids, two boys, uh, you know, a lot of my kids love sports. I don't want that for them. I don't want them to be put in that position to make a tough choice. And so it's just not ideal. But it is also a time. It's interesting because you know so much going back to this part of the media and, and the way they they really ran with the story and fair play. I mean, they had it was a green light. You know, nobody was going to argue with them. I lost all credibility overnight. And so I'd, I couldn't defend myself. So they were just going to say whatever. But at the end of the day, if you go back and like us and uh, my peers, there's no secrets. You know, it's it's a little like war. I mean, there's just no secrets. You know, guys from year to year switch teams or or even if they don't switch teams, you'll have, you know, if they're two Italian guys that aren't completely, they could be the biggest rival teams in the whole sport. And, but yet they live in the same village down in Tuscany and they train together every day. Believe me. They talk about 
everything. There are no secrets. Shit, we all knew what everybody was doing. I mean, I think at this point, I think it's like, it's all out there and everyone's learning their lesson if there's any lesson to be learned and then move forward, right? I think if there's any debt to be paid, it's like you've done all of that. Yeah. And it sounds like, again, through a lot of the conversation, it sounds like you've really come full circle on that whole process. But I'm just curious in terms of that mental resiliency. I think that's where it was particularly interesting for me personally, just aside from post-cycling. I mean, that, that was probably just very stressful. Like during the cycling, going competing at a high level for those seven years. Um, and then the health issues, right? Like cancer, it, was it kind of you had to learn, otherwise you would not survive that mental resiliency. Did you have inspirations in terms of philosophy? Was it a lot of self-reflection, just thinking about how you were going to maintain peak cognitive state? Walk us through kind of that internal journey, mm -hmm. whether that's through the health, the competition, the post-cycling career and that fallout and, yeah. and, and, and today. Uh, I'd love to hear that mental journey. Right. So, I was diagnosed October of 1996. So, it's been, you know, this year will be 24 years since that diagnosis. And so for me, there's really, and let's just use three periods of time, which I think you just alluded to. So let's go with 1996. Let's just use Oprah, okay? It's, uh, January of 2013. And then let's use arguably the, or the biggest tectonic shift that anybody in our lifetime has ever experienced, COVID right now. And so starting with cancer, I mean, it, it was an interesting time to be diagnosed because this is, and we, it's impossible for people to relate today, but there was no internet, right? There was no Google. There were no resources for support, for advice, for research. There was no North Star, right? Your North Star was your, was your local doctor that said, yeah, this is what you have and this is what we're going to do. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, look at what's happening today with people's health. No, nobody's thinking that way. I mean, there's there's so much information at our fingertips, but it was a wild time. To, I mean, I was grabbing pamphlets at the doctor's office. I was going to the fucking bookstore. When was the last time anybody went to a bookstore? <laughs> right? To calling read a around. Book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Calling around. People, hey, man, I heard your, didn't you say your neighbor had cancer at some point? Can you think I could talk to them? Like, what, what, what was that like? And how, how are they doing? And, and just gathering information that way. It was, feels like you're, we were in the stone ages. I, I tried to, at that time, trying to put myself back 24 years ago, but I really tried to simplify the process as much as I could. I'm not a very complex or complicated. I'm, I might be complicated, but I'm not that complex. I wanted to simplify it as much as I could. I knew I needed a team. I found the best doctor and team of nurses that I could, which I'd found in Indianapolis, Indiana with Dr. Larry Einhorn and Latrice Haney, uh, head of nursing, all the people. I was like, all right, this is my team. Right. And then from that point, you go to this place like, all right, I've been given a 50 50 chance. So that's a coin toss. You know, I have no say in that game. It's all at this point, it's up to them. It's up to, to Dr. Einhorn and the team, the medicine, the science. I either live or I die. And so I viewed it like that. I viewed it as a game, as a almost like a scoreboard. Every time I would get blood work back, specifically looking at tumor markers and more specifically looking at my main tumor marker was beta HCG. If any women are listening, that's that's a, a pregnancy test. So mm, yep. quite a few months, I was either super fucking sick or super pregnant. Either way, it was going to be a story. <laughs> and so I, I looked at those and then also just visually looking at, at chest x-rays and other scans. I mean, when I started, probably 10 golf ball sized tumors in the lungs, you know, we do chest x-rays, not that often, but I could visually see them shrinking. I could I could observe and look at tumor markers coming down. So just like any game, right? When you get when you get going and you get that momentum going, people talk all the time about the zone. When you're in that zone, you're like, I got this. You so you almost gamified your cancer treatment. Hundred percent. Every time every time I I knew that chemotherapy was killing cancerous cells and being and I, and they were being released from the body through you know, whatever urine or, or whatever. Every time I went to the bathroom, I said, see you later, motherfuckers. <laughs> I did every, every single time. And so, yeah, I totally gamified it. And, and, and as the numbers got lower and lower, I just got, and I never, you know, knock on wood because anything can happen, but I, I never had a setback, so to speak. I never had a period where uh, numbers look good. They look good. They look good. Oh, now we're, they're not dropping like they were. Cause you know, cancer is smart, right? And, and it, can adjust and adapt to chemotherapies and juke and jive. We know that. I never had that. It always, it just shot down. And so I was like, I felt like I was up by 50 on the scoreboard. 
That's that's interesting. So it was very much, yeah, you gamified it versus becoming, some folks get philosophical. They start reading Stoicism, you know, they read Marcus Aurelius's, you know, journal of surviving the barbarian invasion of the Roman Empire. I'm right. just curious. Yeah. Was, so it sounded like it, there was less a philosophical war. It was more, hey, I'm going to beat the shit out of these tumors and yeah. I'm crushing them every day. And yeah, it's like, and that, uh, um, kind of like a, like a competition sport athlete approach yeah, to it. Yeah, and that was 24 years old. And, you know, if you just said Marcus Aurelius, I would have been like, who? <laughs> Sto- what's stoicism? I mean, I'm sitting here at my desk in Aspen and I'm, you know, in my hand I have, uh, my, he's a good friend of mine, thank God, because he's just such a badass. But I have Ryan Holiday's Obstacles the Way. Uh, Ryan yep. probably our full disclosure, he's on my advisory board over at our fund. And people ask me, oh, who's Ryan Holiday? I say, he's, you know, he's probably the next Malcolm Gladwell for, for, for this generation. And so I, I would, at 48 years old, I'd probably be much more inclined to, to read things like this than I would have uh, half of my life ago. But, and I do think that, you know, fast forwarding to 2013, although I didn't know Ryan at the time, I wasn't a fan or a, a student of his work in 2013, is I go back and, and learn his work and learn stoicism and the principles and the endurance that's required there. It is what I did. You know, I, I was in a situation... I had my eyes wide open. I knew that I was going to go from hero to zero overnight. I also knew that at some point I'd come back in some form or fashion, but I didn't know when. But I just had to stay strong and not not, not even so much stay strong. Just, I couldn't crack, right? So what are your choices there? Your choices lay down and curl up and cry, feel sorry for yourself, make a bunch of bad decisions with regards to your health or substances, ignore, you know, be distanced from your friends and family. I didn't do that. I leaned into all of that stuff. Most importantly, I leaned into the people that leaned into me and the people who leaned out on my life and on my story were, as far as I was concerned, were uh, gone forever. But the ones who had the courage and the, and the loyalty to be a great friend to me during that time, I, I, you know, I put myself in a fire for them. And so, you know, again, uh, I, I think my main motivation were these kids and, and they were I have two chunks of kids. So I had kids that were kind of preteens. And then I had really little kids. I had a one and a, a two-year-old. And so my older kids, were I knew they were going to watch their dad navigate this. Not that they were sitting there like, oh, hey, dad, let's see how this works. I, <laughs> but I knew, you know, I knew they would be paying attention. And so I, I just wanted to be somewhat uh, noble, as noble as I could be, and as tough as I could be, and as resilient as I could be. Yeah, so definitely it feels like the tone went from gamification to to what would you say would be like the the theme of that tr- mental transition. It sounded like you were just leaning at the people that leaned back. It was kind of polarized the people around you, the inner circle that stayed, they're your ride and die, that like small, tight knit social support. Yeah. Was I think that, the, than- was there like internal faith? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of just either internal confidence, internal faith. There's something that did not let you like go into, I, I think, like the dark side with that substance abuse or and basically anesthesia, right? Like, okay, I feel shitty. I'm going to just like blow my. I was gonna say blow my brains out, but like not necessarily like kill yourself, but like. And I don't want to sound that heroic because there were plenty of times where you do want to numb. And again, going back to the alcohol thing, I mean, I'll be just very candid. I mean, that that was certainly at times a way to, I could still maintain my fitness, maintain my productivity, but there was plenty of that, uh, plenty of nights of that where you just kind of numb out. But, you know, I think if I had to, if we're trying to sum it up with a word or with a a, a few words, I would say that those or not those, these last, I mean, Oprah was seven and, you know, seven years and change, right? And so those were growth years for me. Typically, people probably, don't, they probably experienced that in their 20s or 30s. I, it took me to my 40s and it took an event like this to really teach me the things that, what it means to be a man what it means to be fair and honorable and what it, and if you go back to Oprah time, maybe you could watch the interview. I mean, if you compare the Oprah interview to you know, myself on Joe Rogan or to this interview, it's, they're all very different, right? And so yeah. it took me years to go, ah, okay. My attitude when I sat with Oprah is like, what, what's, the, what's the fucking problem? What's, what's y'all's problem? Like, you can't understand that everybody was doing this. You can't understand that I did the same thing. You can't understand that I leveraged that to build a movement and raise half a billion dollars and save a million. You can't understand that. You can't give me a pass on that. That was my attitude at the time. Yep. And so as I sit here in 2020, 
I, I look at that relationship with myself and the world, right? Because it was truly was a, a, a relationship between me and the entire world. I look at it very differently. And I understand the pain and the hurt and the disappointment that people experienced. I think it also speaks to just how big the story was, a story that I never even knew was that big. I, dis- I didn't dismiss it, I guess, but I was clueless to just how far that story reached. And so, again, something I've learned and not anything I could change. I mean, I look back and, and, and frankly, not anything I'd want to change because I've, I've just learned a lot and, and, and feel pretty damn content with my life at this point. And so, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I think if you just think about templates of people's lives, a lot of people tread on paths that other people have tread, right? So, like, in choosing a life to, to be lived, is it interesting or, or novel to do the same path that thousands of other people have led or be a little bit adventurous and, and, and create a very distinct, unique life narrative and life story. And I think, you know, everyone has their own risk tolerance and choices. But to me personally, I think it is kind of cool to live a very unique set of experiences of challenges and wins and victories. And like that very rare set of emotions is like an interesting story. And I think it's like either inspirational or a learning lesson, however people want to take it. And it's almost like I think people should almost lean into because that's how you get kind of the novelty or the uniqueness of one's own journey. Right. (laughs) Yeah. To bring it full circle, I mean, we just using those three time periods of, of where that gets you today with, with an unprecedented time, uncertain time, certainly, you know, how I view all of this and, and, and frankly, just view the, uh, the opportunity and a reset, whether it's with my own health or whether it's, you know, the world's opportunity to hit reset. All of these experiences have added up to, I mean, the first experience helped me navigate the second one. The first two experiences have helped me and my family navigate this third one. In a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a blessing, right? I would, I, I'd have been a mess if I would have lived 2013 till I, I may not even be here if I would if if I hadn't experienced cancer in '96. Right? It really prepared me for shit show number two, and who knows would have been very different. Yeah, I mean, looking a little bit forward, I mean, clearly that competitive chip on the shoulder mentality carries through. So at this current stage, how are you channeling that? I mean, is that something that ever goes away? I mean, it seems like it's like a very ingrained part of your character, your personality. How are you channeling that today? Where does that competition go? Moving yeah, forward? I mean, I've had to adjust. I mean, it's, I've been a professional athlete for a long time. I mean, even before the years that most people followed or know about, I mean, I, I, was, I turned professional in the sport of triathlon when I was 15. Gosh, I mean, that's 33 years ago. So, I've been doing this for a long time. But while you can do it, 15 sounds really young, you know, 48 is an age where you, you just can't, you can't be competitive. And so it, I've had that conversation with myself and agreed with myself that my competitive days, uh, no matter how much I want to be competitive, whether it's a, a trail run or a triathlon or a mountain bike, whatever, uh, you just can't. I mean, a 48 year old guy that lives like a monk is never going to beat a 24 year old uh, who lives like a monk. And so yeah. No matter how sage or savvy or experienced you are, they, they got you every time. That was a rough conversation, but I eventually let the smart side of me um, win the conversation. And <clears throat> but there's other ways. I mean, there's I, I look at when we do our you know our, our our show really peaks during the tour, which is you know it's, it starts uh, on iTunes in the sports category. It starts at number three, and the, and I go, God damn it, you know number th- we're third. Are you kidding me? Well, who the fuck is first and second? And the minute it gets to, you know, to number one, which it does every summer now, I'm like, all right, that's exactly right. That's exactly where we're supposed to be. And so, I mean, I can be competitive that way. Um, I'm certainly very competitive on, on the investing side, doing, doing making investments as, as we do uh, at the fund at Next Ventures. You know, and that's also kind of crosses the line between being competitive, which inherently uh, I am and my team is, but also just being really, really fucking responsible because it's not, while well, a lot of the money is our money, most of the money is other people's money. And so, I mean, you guys know this in spades at, at Human. I mean, this is, you know, when, when somebody else trusts you with their money, uh, it takes the level of commitment and responsibility to a whole, it's a new game. And so that's, uh, yeah. you know, we've done, I think we've done a great job making some great investments and, and, and we'll provide a, a, a pretty great return for our investors. 
Yeah, I mean, that definite fiduciary duty. And also just, yeah, I think it's like, at least the way I think about it, it's like, if I fuck up my own money, it's like, all right, I'm stupid. But if you destroy other people's money, it's like, oh, fuck, I let my people down, which is probably even more painful than like messing yourself up. Yeah. Um, in terms of like health and longevity, there's some performance goals you're still getting after. I mean, when you're doing your training, is there like goals now or is like the goal like longevity, health? Are there different markers you're looking at? Maybe not trying to max out wattage to kilogram ratio right. but longevity get, markers yeah. blood glucose insulin all the things that uh our community likes to nerd out about any are you quantitative on that front and competitive in terms of hey i want to have like the best metabolic markers for longevity or is that not, not, too not nerdy? So. let me i'll give you some examples so i don't uh i don't have a power meter on my bike and going back to our discussion a while ago i mean i couldn't tell you if i was going 495 watts i don't i very rarely ride with a heart rate monitor I'll be a little more specific on the runs just because running uh, is a lot more steady state and time is, is, is more relevant. And, you know, I was, you know, I'm very passionate about uh, posting on Strava. Um, and so I see I can you know, compare and contrast there. You know, I'm a big, a big fan. And, and fortunately, I've been blessed to just be really fucking good at sleeping. So I'm a big fan of sleep. Mm -hmm. I, I keep close tabs on my sleep. Uh, through the aura ring and, and my data through that, um, which obviously has really, really changed the last seven weeks, cutting out alcohol it's made a big difference. That's it. Oh, how just sleep? How do you feel when you wake up? How, you know, you ran two hours Sunday on Monday, like how sore does your right hip hurt? Cause it always hurts. Does it hurt as bad as it used to hurt? Or does it hurt less? More subtle uh, data points. How's your recovery? How's, um, how's your clarity? We're doing this podcast now. I've been up since six 30 straight on to calls and how am I focusing? This sounds hokey, but like, how are you focusing? How are you actually sharing time with somebody else since 630 this morning? Are you, are you looking at your phone? Are you, are you fucking laser focused on what they're telling you and what you're telling them? I'm really into that stuff right now. Not, not so much. On, I, I don't weigh myself. Very rarely do I. I do have a scale in there, but don't get on it that often. I know enough to look at myself and go, okay, you're at a good place right now. And, and not, I don't, it's just not truly geeky on, I mean, I don't even know the last time I measured lactate. And so it's just more taking kind of measurements through the day, whether it's with, again, mood, uh, sleep, clarity, recovery, soreness. And I've measured, and the only thing I really measure is, truth be told, I measure my golf game, which is, is, a, whole, <laughs> is, a, is a whole nother, that's another podcast. And it, that's the one I probably cry on and, and kick and scream and, and call everybody motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, the competitive is definitely still there. I'm curious in terms of, Intermittent fasting, nutrition, those have been popular concepts within longevity, human performance over the last few years. What does that look like? Obviously, probably a lot different from the competition days. Yep. Has that evolved? So that's totally evolved. I mean, when we raced, we, we ate or consumed basically a traditional European diet. At the end of the day, the thing that ruled more than anything was the scale. And so, if that scale wasn't telling you what it had, what it what you needed it to tell you, then you just had to eat less. I mean, it's very simple. You just had to starve. And so here of late, because it was a big adjustment for me to go from, again, not to keep harping on this, but to, to have alcohol uh, daily, uh, to go to none, I, 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 I was like, all right, that's a big jump. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right away here. And, and, and then I haven't gotten to the phase. In a, and if you'd have said intermittent fasting, it's in 1999, we would have said, what? What are you talking about? No, I don't know what that is. And so I've yet to really, I wanted to clear the first big hurdle. Um, I, one thing I do, I just try to eat healthier. If I could, I would lean towards plant-based. Um, I mean, my breakfast this morning was plant-based, was a bowl of, uh, of Rip's Big Bowl cereal with uh, banana and some oat milk. I feel good physically when I eat like that. And I, and I, and mentally you can really, I tell you what, I'll just, if I had two choices, if one was breakfast tacos and one was that bowl of a plant-based cereal, and you can't imagine that, well, you guys can imagine the difference uh, from a clarity perspective, but it is, everybody has an opinion about this. We don't need to get into that, but I notice a difference just from a, a mental focus clarity standpoint. Yeah, there's a, a huge can of worms between vegan, carnivore. I'm sure you might have seen some of the discussion there. But mm -hmm. let's not open necessarily open up that can of worms. You know, looking for in the future of sport. I mean, obviously, still a very sharp observer on the cycling game, as you mentioned. You know, it, it's been fun to listen to the move and get 
kind of the expert opinion of what the crew that you have on that. How has the sport evolved and how do you see the sport evolving? I mean, you have a mutual friend, Dylan Casey. It's kind of interesting to hear his thoughts on the weirdness of the sport, how it's very different from other leagues. If you were a dictator of cycling union, what would you change? Where do you, where do you think the sport evolves and, and goes from here? Yeah, that, that isn't just another podcast. That's a whole series of podcasts, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I'll, I'll try to tackle it. Yeah, and Dylan has a great perspective on it. I mean, Dylan is a guy who raced, just to, this is our, our mutual friend Dylan Casey, who raced on Postal with us. Uh, by the way, he's, a, he's a, not only a great friend of mine, but uh, one of the co-founders of, of We Do and also on my advisory board at Next Ventures. But he has a great view on this because he's been an athlete and he's been a businessman. And so the business model of professional cycling is completely dysfunctional, backwards. There's a lot of ways to start this conversation, but it, it the stakeholders the real stakeholders are not necessarily uh, represented the classic or old infrastructure of the tour controlling all the power. You really have the Tour de France and then you have the, the worldwide governing body, the UCI, which just for starters, I would argue we absolutely do not need. So if I were, if I were the warlord of, of world of global cycling, I would remove myself, I would remove the sport from the Olympic movement, which means you remove yourself from the governing body. So you're no longer beholden to the IOC, the USOC, all of the Olympic governing bodies and all that that. So obviously that means you, you don't go to the Olympics, but truth be told, most cyclists don't care about the Olympics, right? Most professional cyclists just don't care. They care about the tour. They care about the classics. They care about the world championships. So you remove yourself from that and you make yourself, you make the sport more similar to Formula One. Major League Baseball, the NFL, mm -hmm. you structure it that way where the, the stakeholders all have a vested interest in the success of the sport. They all have seats at the table. So whether, whether the discussion is in and around rider safety, whether it's in and around the sharing of global TV revenue, whether it's around sponsorship, whether it's around calendar, whether it's around doping, whether it doesn't, all of these things, the stakeholders, the events, the teams, the sponsors, the riders, the media. And to a certain extent, the fans, they all have a seat at the table. And right now, the riders certainly don't have a seat at the table. The teams have like a toe at the table. It's completely dysfunctional. And so you have to go back. Best case scenario, you would have somebody, and this is not an idea that I haven't played with or visited or tried to research, but you'd buy the tour. You'd have somebody or a group of people buy the tour um, and you would reinvent the, the sport needs to be reinvented. You know, as, as it exists today, you have three grand tours. We call them grand tours, and then you have other smaller tours. The grand tours are the three-week tours. You have Tour of Italy, Tour de France, and Tour of Spain. The tour is 10 times bigger than the Giro, and the Giro is 10 times bigger than the Tour of Spain. And so it's, you know, you see the disparity there. I take them all, and I make all of them two weeks. They're all two weeks. Like it or not, tour, they all lose a week of revenue. Doesn't matter. They're all two-week races. I'm a big believer in and storylines and characters and personalities and interest, right? And global interest, fan interest, media interest. If you make them all two weeks, which by the way, in the midst of this entire Corona shit show, this was our opportunity to try this out. And what are they, what, what are all those organizers in Europe doing right now? Well, no, no, my event is going to be right fucking then and there, and it's going to be three weeks and we're going to be the, no, come together. There was talk of having a, a three-week hybrid tour, a week in Italy, a week in France, a week in Spain. What a beautiful fucking idea. All of those three individual race directors said, no way, I'm not sharing. Back to my point, make them all two weeks, allow one rider and one team to do the Grand Slam, right? What do we love more, and let's use golf and tennis as examples, right? So the last person that could have done it was Tiger. You know, he got away with the Tiger Slam, but a Federer winning the Grand Slam, I mean, that would, dude, that is such a big, tennis, nobody fucking watches tennis. If in, It doesn't even have to be Federer. If he gets through the third and he's playing in the fourth to win the slam, I promise you, everybody watches. Yep, same it's a story. Yes, it's a story. It's a storyline. It's like, dude, I don't, people sit back and go, dude, I don't know anything about tennis, but holy shit, my buddy said that this guy might do it. Fuck, what's his name? You know, his name is Mickey Mouse. I don't care. I'm going to watch, right? <laughs> Yep. Or the same in golf. It, it could happen in cycling. So allow, you know, create 
opportunities for those storylines. Now, the tour would have to give up something. They'd give up that week. In, in a fair world, the athletes, the most important people in this play, share in global TV revenue. They have a strong union. They have representation. They have a voice. They have uh, a future. They have a pension. All the things that we see with all the major unions. So I told you this is a whole series of... Uh, dude, you got me started. So it, no, It's even, like super interesting. Yeah, even all the way down... When the race finishes uphill, and this we're getting into the weeds here, but when the race finishes uphill and they're going 10 miles an hour, okay, when, when Kipchoge ran the marathon in just under two hours, he averaged 13 miles an hour. He could have stubbed his toe and fell down and hit a curb. If the riders are going 10 miles an hour, take the fucking helmets off. Let's see who's bald. Let's see who's got long hair. Let's see who's got blonde hair. Let's see. Think back to sort of the golden years when you, you know, when I came into the sport, you were watching Gert Jan Tunisa with the long flowing hair, Phil Anderson, uh, Roach, you know, all these dudes to my generation. I mean, you saw Pantani. Pantani was Pantani because he looked like Pantani. If he was wearing a, a big old helmet and, and ski goggles, he would never have been Pantani, ever. Uh, to me, like, let those personalities come through. We don't, we've almost gotten to this place where it's too robotic. Last thing I'll say is, speaking of robotic, is so, uh, we as a sport have been very anti-technology. There's no sport in the world. F1 would never say, no, no, you know, I don't, disc brakes in the cars or electronics or uh, aerodynamics, that sounds, no, mm -mm. let's go backwards. No, they let the sport evolve. When the sport evolves, when the, when the tip of the spear evolves, the very next thing to evolve is the industry, the fucking thing that fuels and pays for the sport. If you're not allowing the tip of the spear, the competitive side, the Tour de France, the best of the best to evolve technologically, then you're really handcuffing the industry, right? So they can't, buddy, if you would have watched, maybe you guys did, this debate over the last five years about disc brakes, like, do we allow disc brakes? I'm like, are you shitting me? First of all, it's far safer. Secondly, it's exactly what the industry needs because everybody that gets five years down the line looks at their bike and they're like, oh my God, I I'm watching the tour and they all have disc uh, brakes and all my neighbors have disc yeah, brakes and I've got, and I've got calipers. Like, I got to get a new bike. Well, what does that do for the industry? So it allows that to grow as well. And then all the other things that are controversial, race radio, power meters. You know what I say? I say you embrace that technology. You take the power meter. You don't, you don't try to ban them. No, you publicize them. You publish them. You make them all these boring days that we watch the tour. They're going along for five hours. That's all public. We're seeing everybody's power meter, uh, power output. We're seeing everybody's heart rate, everybody's core temp, everybody's, uh, we see speed and wind and, and race open race communications. You're hearing them talking to the car and to their other teammates. Dude, that's just content gold. So. I mean, I think it just makes it's just it's just common sense from a progress and technology perspective. This is going to happen with amateurs, regardless. I mean, like people are using all these things. I mean, that's just progress. You don't stop technology; you lean forward, embrace it, and evolve with it. And I think that's the, kind of the growth mindset. Like we're not playing with wooden rackets and tennis anymore, and people aren't using like the baggy swim shorts when they're doing Olympic swimming. And it sounds like the same analogy holds for cycling as well. Like we should, we got to progress with the times. Yeah. And it sounds like it's you also get more content from it, just more entertaining if you can kind of get behind under the hood, if you will. Yeah, which is kind of interesting to hear you come full circle on not just the athlete side, but it sounds interesting to get your hear your wheels turning with the business side if you can like bring together the tours. I think that's kind of a clever concept, right? Like for horse racing, for example, not to compare cyclists to, to horses, but like you hear the triple crown and it's like, I don't watch horse racing at all, but you kind of hear when people are close to making the triple crown, I kind of like at least kind of pay attention. Yep. And uh, that makes sense. You know, it sounds like you talked about Next Ventures a couple times. What's the sweet spot for you guys? I I've read over the years that... You've been actually pretty active as an investor, getting some early exposure to Uber, which we've all heard of, you know, back in the day. What's the sweet spot for Next Ventures and, and what you're excited about in terms of technology? What are the main projects that you're focused on 2020? Obviously, a lot of plans probably have changed, but yeah. where's your mind at in terms of future projects, future competitions, yeah. future areas to, to dominate? 
Well, our focus is, is you know, a space that you guys know well, I mean, health and wellness, fitness, nutrition, optimization. You know, we believe that a lot of people care about and that a lot more people are going to per- care about in the future, future generations. We know, uh, without a doubt, um, are focused on this. And so that's our sweet spot. We come at it from a slightly different perspective than a traditional VC firm in the sense that the fund and the firm was born out of creating content. You know, as I started to create content and build back this audience and the downloads piled up, when that happened, I just started to get all this deal flow, really cool, interesting deal flow uh, coming at me. So as that piled up, I said, this, I see what's happening here. This is, and we've seen other folks do it, right? I mean, you've seen Tim Ferriss do it, Gary Vee do it, Saka. Ben Greenfield, a lot lot of people. And so it's, I wanted a more traditional structure when it came to the fund. I wasn't going to just do it myself or run it as a friends and family. I wanted a more traditional uh, VC setup with regards to the the whole GPLP structure. And and I wanted to build a great team, which I did. I mean, my my two partners, Lionel and Mel, are are total badasses. Our advisory board, if you take the time to look look through those bios on nextventures.com, I mean, they're, I'd put it up against really anybody. We've got a great crew there, and we're in it to, as you, as we touched on earlier, to be very successful for our investors. And at the end of the day, you know, I was going to cut you off early and say it, or say it earlier, but I mean, at the end of the day, what you want is you want that second phone call to be easy, right? The first phone call is hard, and you got to ask somebody to trust you and invest with you. You want the second phone call to be easy. You want to call them and go, "Hey, we're raising a second fund or a third fund, or what? Are you guys are doing a, a whatever a B round or a C, whatever it is?" And they go. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, of course. Love what love what you're doing. Love how it's going. I'm in. You double down. Yeah, yeah. That's what you, that's what you, or, or even more than double down. But that's yeah. that's what you. Uh, that's kind of a, a dream scenario. And so it's gone well. I mean, we're still actively raising, so you can imagine what the last couple of months have been like amidst <laughs> amidst amidst all of this. And and frankly, I don't. I mean, I, I still play a little bit in the personally investing, and I've been the same way. I mean, I've, I've just told people, look, I don't know what the hell's going on. I want to just take a second and, and, and try to either get some clarity here or let this slow down or, or, or let us come out of this before I re-engage in these conversations. So I don't, that's not surprising. But yeah, I mean, it's the companies. And, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, we, you know, we've been sort of not by design, but we were very fortunate with some of the bets that we made before COVID uh, that have really, really benefited tremendously. Uh, you see the Aura Ring, who's come out of this thing, telling a great story. Obviously, the partnerships with UCSF and University of West Virginia, and, and just actually, literally seeing people being diagnosed with the disease, uh, who who are fans of the Ring and watching their their core temp rise over time. PowerDot, another blessed play, at home therapy for e STEM. You know, nobody's going into a chiropractor's office or a PT office these days, and so this is perfect for them. And then our one of our latest was a, a telemedicine company out of St. Louis called SteadyMD, which is kind of all the buzz right now yeah. um, when it comes to just personal health care, that personal relationship with the doctor. I mean, uh, with like the just general economic carnage, uh, there is like that opportunity. It sounds like there's definitely areas that will be kind of that creative destruction, creative growth. And hopefully, we can fuel and support those as a lot of this kind of world shakes out. But yeah, I mean, there's looking at some of the public company stocks with like teledoc that are telemedicine, that whole area is going to be changing, which is kind of exciting from a opportunities perspective. And then personal projects, I mean, pretty active on the podcast game, the social media, anything on the personal front for the rest of 2020. It's all about our kids. I mean, obviously our kids have been home for months. I've been doing Zoom classes and I won my oldest, I mentioned earlier in the show, I've got kind of two chunks of kids. Those ones I said were preteens or now one is about to be 21. He's a, he's a sophomore at Rice University down in Houston, plays football there. Um, I've got two girls uh, that are 18 that are seniors in high school, one going to TCU and the other going to University of Colorado in Boulder. This is a big time. I mean, we're trying to, not only are they going to college, off to college, but we're trying to get a sense for whether or not they're going to actually go to college. And I, God, I hope they do. I mean, I never, I never had the, I never went to college. You know, I never, I never knew what that was like to get in the car with mom and dad and drive three hours and cross the city limit and go, oh, fuck, I mean, I'm here, man. I'm in Boulder. I'm about to get out and I'm going to step into my dorm. I don't know the people. I don't know anything. Like, I don't know what that's all about, but I think that's kind of irreplaceable. And so for my girls, I would hate to think that 
you know, that, that there isn't that drive. There's not that city limit. There's not that, you know, initiation by fire. And instead yeah. it's a zoom, you know, so I, I'm fingers crossed that they can, and that's what they want. You know, it's funny. I mean, these kids nowadays, you know, very different than we were kids. I mean, when we were kids and I was, I was the first dude in line at the DMV to get my driver's license. I was like, give me the fucking license right now. <laughs> and, and I cared about prom and you cared about your yearbook and you cared about graduation these kids now that they're, they're, they're like, I'm like, Oh, they don't have graduation or you don't have prom. They're like, I don't care. <laughs> they're different, man. And they're more, it's cool. Like it's, it's a watch. What are they into? Are they into the TikTok? Like what are they into that? <laughs> you know, I over here, I can't keep up, dude. I can barely do Instagram. So I, I overhear that stuff, but it, you know, I've got a, the 18 year old girls and I've also got a nine year old girl. So they're, you know, whatever TikTok is, I can tell you it, it at least spans those 10 years or that decade. I can't keep up. Have them build you a, a TikTok account and we'll see you doing some meme dances very soon. You know, <laughs> and that would probably be viewed by a lot. I'm so bad at dancing. I, it was, it, I'm so shitty that it, it's just bound to have a lot of views. All right. We'll put it on the record here. We're going to have a Lance Armstrong TikTok and we're going to see some meme dances coming out shortly. <sighs> Oh, God. Well, thanks so much for the conversation. Really, I think, useful both on the metrics, biohacking, porn side, as well as like the mindset and, and, and the whole narrative and journey. Thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. Big fans of you guys and uh, appreciate you having me on. And you guys are, as you well know, are very involved in the sport, which I think is great. I just love, I love the fact the discussion around ketones and ketone esters and ketosis is such a discussion. And I mean, I, I think that's how... I think that's uh, that's the way it should be. I think we should evolve and think forward. Definitely. I mean, I think it's the natural progression of technology and part of technology is also the nutrition technology piece. Sure. And yeah, very happy to play a small part there. And I know that you had your tentacles and ears on the floor when some of the initial rumors came out a couple of years ago. So uh, props to you and your continued uh, mastery and knowledge of the sport and still influencing and kind of taste making in the sport today hopefully you were able to refill the shelves after we sold you out <laughs> yeah we were stocked out for a little bit uh but back in stock now for, for, for q2 q1 awesome all right buddy all right yep thanks talk to you soon. yep talk soon thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the hvmn podcast if you're interested to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit hvmn.com slash pod. Please remember to subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please give this video a like and remember to hit that bell to get notified whenever we post. We also have a dedicated Discord server, which you can join by first taking a short survey and then I'll personally send you an invite to join the community there. The link to that survey will be in the description along with any other relevant links. And we'll see you all next week.